Time and again, Muslims have been questioned how verses sent 1,400 years ago could possibly be preserved word to word, let alone a whole book. Every time Muslims have defended the divinity of the holy book of Quran, but some think that's a given, considering it's their religious right. But non-Muslims too have acknowledged the preservation of the holy Quran. They weren't random people either. The non-Muslims were religious scholars, devout academics, and zealous Christians, basically authorities of religion. Number 1. William Muir A Scottish Orientalist has authored several books, primarily to distort the image of Islam. However, in his book, Life of Muhammad, Muir acknowledges how the textual revision of Uthman was handed down unaltered. Referring to the Holy Qur'an, Muir writes, There is probably in the world no other work which has remained for twelve centuries with so pure a text. Number 2. Named Kenneth Cragg, Kenneth Cragg, an Anglican priest and scholar, also reported that the Qur'an, as it stood in Uthman's recension, omits no significant information and includes no extraneous material. Okay. The Prophet's death had decisively closed the book. Number 3. Georges Louis Le Blois. In fact, in 1887, a French pastor, Georges Louis Le Blois, published a book and wrote down, Quran is, today, the only holy book that does not show notable variants. Number 4. Bosworth Smith. Never heard any of these names before. People argued the reports from the pastors and scholars had no academic basis until Bosworth Smith, a Catholic historian and biographer, authored a controversial book named Muhammad and Muhammadanism. In his book, Smith, referring to the Holy Book of Quran, stated, We have a book absolutely unique in its origin, in its preservation, and in the chaos of its contents, but on the authenticity of which no one has ever been able to cast a serious doubt. Number 5. Philip Hitty. The consensus of view was particularly established by Philip Hitty, a Maronite Christian from Lebanon and the leading scholar of Arabic studies, who stated, On the whole, the text of the Quran today is as Muhammad produced it. As some Semitic scholar remarked, there are probably more variations in the reading of one chapter of Genesis in Hebrew than there are in the entire Quran. Wow. Number 6. John Borton The genuineness of the Holy Quran was further lauded by John Borton, an Arabic professor at the University of Edinburgh, who closes his magnum opus in the collection of the Quran by saying, What we have today in our hands is a mushaf of Muhammad. As the 20th century began, more and more religious authorities started to look into the divine book that did not have a dot written out of place in the last 1300 years. Number 7. Hamilton A. R. Gibb, one of the leading Orientalists of the 20th century, writes, It seems reasonably well established that no material changes were introduced and that the original form and contents of Muhammad's discourses were preserved with scrupulous precision. Then, non-Muslim theologists started taking keen interest in the world of Islam and delved into research as that was the only way they could understand the religious roots without actually converting. Number 8. Adrian Brockett One of the most famous academics at the time was Adrian Brockett, a professor of Arab and Islamic studies at Durham University and one of the scholars in the field of the early textual history of the Qur'an. He magnified how strict the authenticity of the Qur'an actually was and declares, the transmission of the Qur'an after the death of Muhammad was essentially static rather than organic. There was a single text and nothing significant, not even allegedly abrogated material could be even taken out, nor could anything be put in. Number 9. Number Christian nine, Snook right. Hergrani As sectarianism in Islam came to light, many non-Muslims even took that into consideration 
and one of them was Christian Snook Hergrani, the most reputed Dutch Orientalist, who commented that all sects and parties have the same text of the Qur'an. Right. Now that non-Muslim professors and scholars were accepting that the Qur'an was truly undoctored in the past 1400 years, they came under the interrogation lamp of extremists too. Number 10. Ram Landau Most of them quoted back the roots of the Qur'an, relying on history to do the talking of reason. Ram Landau, professor of Islamic studies at the University of the Pacific, referred how it became the task of Muhammad's secretary, Zayd ibn Thabit, to bring these sayings together in textual form. Abu Bakr had directed the work, and later, after a revision at the command of Uthman, the Qur'an took its standard and final form that has come down to us unchanged. Number 11. Forster F. Arbuthnot Backing Landau's statement, a notable British Orientalist, Forster F. Arbuthnot quickly shut down the extremists by saying, a final and complete text of the Qur'an was prepared within 20 years after the death of Muhammad and that this has remained the same without any change or alteration by enthusiasts, translators, or interpolators up to the present time. It is to be regretted that the same cannot be said of all the books of the Old and New Testaments. I mean, that's true. That's, that's facts right there. Number 12. Number 12. Neil Here Robinson. Subhanallah. Islam has truly come a long way. Today, as British Orientalists, Neil Robinson says, the Muslim tradition has met with widespread acceptance from non-Muslim scholars. May Allah safeguard our religion and keep us steadfast. Ameen. Allahu Akbar. And I have no problem saying this. Allahu Akbar, I can say this all I want. Fam, my dear brothers and sisters, I was asked the question whether Allah is the same God as the God of the Old Testament. Okay. And I would like to elaborate on that. The answer to that question is yes. The Muslim concept of Allah is exactly the same as the Jewish concept of Hashem. Uh, therefore, no matter what you hear, you know, some people like to claim that God, Allah is the moon God or whatever, whatever you hear, this is all nonsense. And, um, you know, whether the word Allah was used for something else before Islam, I'm not sure, maybe. I'm not sure exactly, I'm not a linguist. But that's really not the important part. The important part is what is Allah today? What does it, the word, the name of, or the word Allah mean today to Muslims? What it means today to Muslims is exactly the same what Hashem means to the Jews. Hmm. That's really exactly no the argument same. There. Our only argument between Jews and Muslims are whether Muhammad was a prophet or not. That's really the only argument, but the concept of God is, you know, really exactly the same. And therefore, you know, no matter what you hear, even if some Jews tell you that, oh, we don't believe in the same God as the Muslims do, they're only saying this because of political reasons. Right. And everybody knows this, huh. you know, since Jews and Muslims are at war in Israel, so some Jews may be uh, prone to say, oh, therefore anything Muslims do, it's wrong. You know, they will believe in a different God, they do this, this... But this is all nonsense, you know, uh, and in fact, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, who was probably the biggest scholars that, uh, scholar that ever lived, he lived about 1,000 years ago, he said he was really critical of those who are, you know, spreading lies just because of a political um, reason. And he was really critical, and he says those who say that Muslim concept of God is different and it's like idol he says these are bad this is uh, you know bad people I don't know exactly which word he used but he was really critical of those people and he says that in fact he says the Muslim concept of God is exactly the same and not only that he says if a Jew needs to pray he is allowed to go to a mosque and pray hmm. together with the Muslims because the Muslim That's concept huge, of God guys. is exactly the same as the Jewish concept of God. There's no argument there. So I hope this answers your question. And no matter what, by the way, one, one more thing I wanted to mention. Just like in English, we have, we have the word God, right? Back 
maybe 1,000 years ago, I'm not sure what the word God meant. It could have probably be the name of some idol that was named God. And then eventually this term came into English language and it began to be used to a different, uh, uh, in a different connotation to the one God. So therefore, you know, just like, just like somebody who uses the word God today does not necessarily mean that he worships that idol that existed 1,000 years ago, right? Because this is just a word. The way it was used at that time is one thing, now it's used differently. Therefore, same thing yeah. with the, the word Allah. We go by what the word Allah means to Muslims today. It doesn't matter what it meant before Islam. It's not really relevant. So, to answer the question, I want to repeat it and uh, to make sure everybody really understands that. Yes, the Allah is really the same God of the Torah. Allah is the same God of the Torah. And uh, as I said, the only argument uh, Muslims and Jews have is whether Muhammad was a prophet or not. That's really the only argument. As far as God goes, or Allah goes, we believe in the same God. In fact, as a Jew, I can say, and I feel, and I can freely say this, and without even any hesitations, I can use the Arabic phrase, Allahu Akbar. And have no problem saying this. Allahu Akbar, I can say this all I want. And even the part of the, the Shahada that the Muslims say, Lo ilaha illa Allah, I can also freely say this and I don't feel any, you know, remorse about saying this. Okay. Because their concept of God is exactly. exactly the same as the Jewish concept of God. Thank you for watching. Yes. Okay, so, um, okay, he's answering a question. Islam. Uh, was connected with Ishmael in a question. But Islam is a sixth century religion, right? It arose in the sixth century under Muhammad. And Ishmael has nothing to do with Islam except that the Arabs were supposed to have adopted him yet. <laughs> okay. okay. So right. why is it being connected? So it's true that Muhammad was born in the 6th century, he was born in the year 570. When he was 40 years old, his prophetic career began and it lasted for 23 years. In the Arabian Peninsula, a part of the world that God gave to the B'nai Yishmael, to the children of Yishmael. And although Arabs comprise less than 20% of Muslims in the world, their holy book, the Quran, is written in Arabic, and it did emerge out of an Arabic crucible and an Arab culture. There's, that is undeniable. And in Indonesia, where there are, there are as many Muslims in Indonesia as there are Arabs in the world. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, they are reciting the Quran in, in Arabic. Arabic. Yeah. They might not understand what they're saying, they might not, and more frequently than not, they probably don't. And I think that many um, Muslim leaders regret that. But, um, but there is something very interesting about the B'nai Ishmael. We could talk about them for a moment. And that is that God made a covenant with the children of Ishmael. Made a covenant with Hagar, God made a covenant with her son. You read Genesis 16. And out of him would come a great nation. Now, just as the survival of the Jewish people is astounding, I mean, there are only two biblical nations that are here today, the Jews and the, Ar and the Arabs, the Bnei Ishmael. There are no Viscoffs around today. The Vikings are gone. If you want to learn about them, you go to a library, you blow off the dust off a book, and you read about them. That's it. They're, you didn't go to school with them. What is amazing is that for a very long time, from the time of Yishmael's death until the advent of Islam, all Muslims will tell you that the children of Yishmael were in a state of jahiliya. Jahiliya means stupidity. Hmm or absence of knowledge. Ignorance. Without knowledge. Without knowledge, yeah. But they knew that they were B'nai Yishmael. And they never lost that misora 
It was preserved. That's an amazing thing. That means that God, I, I mean the Jews were, although many Jews converted out, lost their identity, lost their faith, of course the Bible is full of people, Jews like that. But we always had a remnant of Jews who were faithful to God, who were deeply faithful to God. Um, the, in the Arab world, they didn't have that. In Arabia, if you were in Arabia in the 6th century, if you were in Mecca in the year 610, they were burying their daughters alive. You can discuss this with any, any, uh, any person who's studied Islam. Everything I'm telling you is, this, every Muslim knows this. They were burying their daughters alive at, at the Kaaba, there were more than 300 different gods that were worshipped there. Right. So, the, the, so idolatry was everywhere in the Arabian Peninsula, except that there were Jews there that worshipped the one true God. And there were Jews in, in what is today Saudi Arabia, what is today Yemen, the Arabian Peninsula. So what is really quite stunning is that here God made a promise to Ishmael going back 4,000 years ago, and, and 1,600, 1,400 years ago, the Arabs still, they've abandoned everything. Because according to Islamic tradition, the children of Ishmael, Muslims do consider Ishmael a prophet as well, but according in Islam, all of Ishmael's descendants were all idol worshippers. So that means according to Islamic tradition, for 2,600 years, they were worshiping idols, but they always knew that they were children of Ishmael and never lost their identity. Mm. And that, I think, is amazing. And then, according to Islamic tradition, of course, uh, Muhammad would begin a prophetic career in 610, and that would continue until 632. Uh, a, a, a prophetic career that will begin in in Mecca and then end in Medina where he's buried today. So I think it's, I think the covenant that God made with the children of Ishmael is astounding that we could see with our eyes that it was preserved. Hmm. And in one way it's as miraculous as the covenant God made with the children of Isaac. Okay. I don't know if you thought about that, but I, 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 I most people go, I never thought about that. <laughs> But, yeah. you know, you just scratch your head and go, well, how do they retain their identity? And what also is interesting is it's not in the Quran. Do you know that the Quran never mentions who Muhammad was a descendant of? The Quran never mentions Muhammad's genealogy. It's not there. In fact, the Quran is totally not interested in genealogies. In the Christian Bible, it's all over the place. The Quran... Not interested. The only genealogy that's very important in the Quran is that of the Jews, the Bnei Yaakov, the children of Israel. That's it. Those are, that's the only genealogy. It is, there's a consensus among Muslims that Muhammad was, in fact, a descendant of Yishmael. Allow his anointed ones in the Old Testament, the Messiah, the Moshiach, to be harmed. So, so this is basically, you know, the, the idea of a crucified Messiah is an oxymoron. It's it's a contradiction yeah. in terms because because that in itself would be a a proof of his imposture. The fact that he right. would be killed that in itself is proof that he's now the truly anointed one can never be put to death. The fact I'll that he's killed. Yeah, I'll take you the and the VA al you yeah. do not harm <laughs> that my anointed ones uh, will not be harmed. Neither will the prophet. God is protecting them. The, the whole look, mm -hmm. all someone has to do is you know. Read Isaiah, read Ezekiel, read John. It's all there. But frankly, yeah. I'll tell you the truth that just Christians never read the book of Jeremiah once in their life. The way the only thing they know about Jeremiah is that they are given these cards, these pamphlets, and go, remember this verse there, remember that verse there, completely out of context, hmm. no clue. Really, this don't read it. You know, a Jewish child goes to yeshiva, goes to school, first will learn Hebrew immediately. Hebrew, yeah. we can, a, a religious Jew can read Hebrew the way a person can read a newspaper.
It's just our first language. And it's an easy language, frankly. And number two is we're learning the whole book. We're not learning. We go through the entire cycle of reading it and understanding it. Christians don't have that. And Christians do not teach Hebrew to their children, even though they believe that Hebrew is a holy language. It doesn't even make sense, except Mm -hmm. that this is an old tradition of church. The church knew that if its parishioners, if its parishioners were able to read Hebrew, that means they can read the Bible on their own without a translation. The whole, you can close up the whole church. So frankly, this is the difference about knowing the original text in its language. I remember in Indonesia, I remember they would have among Muslims in Indonesia, young boys, young boys. I don't know if they were five, six, seven, eight years old, would memorize the whole Quran yeah. they would know it by heart. And they'd be on television. It was very yeah. important, right? But not to the Christian. <laughs> and certainly not in the original language. I mean, in no, Arabic. No, definitely not. I think there, right. there's, no, there's no connectivity. There's nothing. Absolutely None at nothing. all. They're all dependent on yeah. translators. And they argue the biggest argument among Christians is frequently among evangelicals, which translation to use? Yeah. The King James, the King James, oh, nothing. Who cares a translation? Mm-hmm. A translation, translation is a human iteration. By definition, it's not the word of God. Now, translations just, are necessary for people who are not familiar with the original language. Right. But it, that shouldn't be the default. People should be learning a the holy actually, book in the original language. The original language, language. Muhammad. <laughs> There is, there is a saying of the Prophet, this is called Hadith. Hadith? Hadith. 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 Yeah. yeah. These are sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In the Hadith, uh, there's books of Hadith. Uh, there's an excellent book if you're interested in the medical aspect of the Hadith. It's called Tip and Nabawi. It's called the Medicinal uh, Prophetic Medicine. Uh, written by a scholar named Ibn al Qayyim, where he collects these Hadith about different Hadith about medical issues, like the Black Seed, Habba the Soda. Excellent. So good, good. You're getting there. You've been healed by the black seed oil. Subhanallah. So you were healed by following the sunnah. I got rid of an earache. Number three, I got rid of the coronavirus. The coronavirus by the black seed oil. Number four, it's healed by fell about three weeks ago. It's healing. Subhanallah. Five, I take it every day. Black seed oil. You have to be Muslim now. You you, you were cured by the medicine of the Prophet. Black seed oil. She got rid of her cancer after nine months. Black seed oil. Yes. A friend of mine. That's amazing. He got rid of that and he lost the weight. Wow. That's my testimony with the black seed oil. I know your. Allah sent it, and the Prophet told us about it. Black seed oil, the Prophet said, it is a cure for every disease except death. She won't say the word out loud. But she knows it, yeah. There, there have been a lot of studies done as well that are peer-reviewed medical journal entries about the black seed oil. Many doctors know, some of them are scared to admit how widely beneficial it is. I eat it with my food. Excellent, excellent. I like yeah. hmm. And I also use the I gotta get some black seed oil too. So what I try to do is I use the ground or I use actual the seeds with honey in the morning. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So you know that that hadith is true. You it see works. the benefit of it. I that it works. It works. Excellent. You're you're a witness for us. Yes, I'm a witness to testify. Excellent, to excellent. It works. Uh, Subhanallah. Because uh, when I like the like coronavirus, I drank it every hour for two weeks, and I got rid of it. Wow. Nothing Black seed oil. Worked, but I just drank a, a swab Man. of it every hour for a whole two weeks. Amazing. Got rid Amazing, amazing. So, so this is I, something. So I that's know. it. That, then you know the Prophet so spoke know. the truth. So I know, I know. In my heart, Allah huh? did that. Allah did it, yes. yes. So you're ready to be Muslim? Um, in June, I traditionally do uh, Ramadan. You do do Ramadan. I do. Excellent, excellent. Oh, so you do Ramadan. Okay. You know the Prophet Muhammad spoke the truth. You know Allah cured you. You know Allah sent that cure through the Hadith of the Prophet. You're Muslim. We are all born. We are all born. And fitra. There you go. You are. Have you taken the Shahada yet? Not yet. So let's take it. You're already there. You know we're all born Muslim. You know Allah exists, right? You know there is Allah yeah, that cured you. I, I still have a little bit of conditioning with my old beliefs. I still. 
Well, what's left of your old beliefs that we need to condition? Oh, quite a bit, yeah. That's so let us know so we can cleanse it. It's going to take time because I'm very... We got time. I'm, I'm here for you. I'm very meticulous in theology. I'm very Excellent. meticulous in comparative theology and... Wonderful. That's also, what we want. I'm very meticulous in seeing what's in common. Or nice. We talk about the we talk about, look, we talk about the one message foundation to show the common message. Worship one God. Don't worship the idols. Huh? The commandment. What's the first commandment? Israel, here, your Lord is one Lord. That's the second commandment. No idols and worship. Do not kill. We believe in all of those. Exactly. So now the issue here is, you know the Quran is true. You know the hadith are true because you were cured. In my head, but I haven't been revealed a revelation. I you have, you have. This this was a revelation from Allah to guide you that you got rid of the coronavirus through the black seed and yes, you know. That was a sign of miracles because I know. Yes, yes. And that is a miracle of the Prophet because he's the one that told us about it. So you know the Prophet is a true Prophet, right? And God sent my friend Bashar to uh, Iraq. Mashallah. So, before I came to him, he gave me the phylum and he introduced me to the black seed. Alhamdulillah. And I had never heard of any of And that was from Allah. Allah so sent you a guide. Him. Exactly. So now it's your turn to accept at least openly what's already in your heart that you know that Allah exists, right? You bear witness. Excellent. So, okay. So, so, so the, the shahada is two parts, right? One, that you bear witness that there is none that should be worshipped except Allah. No idols, no monkeys, no cows. You agree with that, right? And the second is that the Prophet Muhammad is a true prophet. And you already agree with that, right? Well, I'm not, I don't know enough yet. I mean, so the hadith about the black seed oil, you know that, it's true. I know. Okay. So how would he know that if he wasn't a prophet? He wasn't a doctor, he wasn't a scientist. So I really didn't. So so but but that but that came through a hadith, right? It came to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? So if he wasn't a true prophet, how would he have known that? So that way that way you believe that he was a prophet. So you got it. Sure. So so let's talk about it, right? Well no, I I gotta study. I'm a prophet. Excellent. We want you to study. So tell me tonight, I go home and study. Go home and study. And come back and take your shahada because you're already Muslim in your heart. Well, I, I see it. Okay. Excellent. Great. I enjoy talking to you. Enjoy. We'll see you next Sunday. I wanted to share that testimony. I, I appreciate it. It's important. It is me. very important. To tell everybody the truth about that. You know what? I don't I'll rely on medicine. Good. Medicine. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I mean, the black seed, the Prophet said about it, that it's a cure for every disease except, except death. death. Yeah. And you are a testimony to that. Even as a non-Muslim, you are testifying yeah, to the truthfulness of the Prophet. Oil, Excellent. 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 We, we want you to bring your Shahada out next Sunday. After you do your studies, come back. We'll do your Shahada. Okay. Okay? May Allah guide you.